Hello everybody, welcome back once again, back to this series that I'm going over on a closer walk with God. I'm Pastor Brian Helfrich, Senior Pastor of The Barn, we're a church in Colorado, if you guys are joining us from any other place. So glad you guys are here today. Um, so yeah, tonight's we're into part two of Are You a Disciple of Jesus? So let's start out. Just Lord, I just thank you for this time and I thank you for the people that are listening, Lord. I thank you that, that everyone listening has a heart and they want to grow into having a closer walk with you, Lord, and, and learning what it means to have a, be a disciple and have discipleship with you, to learn from you, Lord. I just lift up everyone listening I just, and myself, too. I just ask me to be, that you help me be a vessel to your people, Lord, to teach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. So, I'm going to do a quick review. Last, uh, last week, we went over uh, number one, part one, of Are You a Disciple of Jesus? Uh, some of the things we touched on. And if it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, we may put it on some other platforms. Uh, go check it out if you didn't uh, get a chance to watch it. But I'm going to review just in case you've forgotten anything over this last week. We've got, uh, first, the definition of a disciple is a learner or an adherent, um, somebody that's an imitator of, of their teacher. Um, the goal of being a disciple is to be like your teacher. You know, so if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, we want to strive to be like Jesus. Um, some of the marks of being a disciple, a disciple is one who abides in Jesus' words. A disciple is also one who loves the brethren. And the third thing, a disciple is one who bears much fruit. So we're going to bear fruit if we're truly a disciple of Jesus. Um, in this lesson today, I'm going to dive into part two. Are you a disciple of Jesus? I touched on this briefly last week on um, this first point. First point we're going to talk about is the cost of being a disciple. Uh, part of being a disciple of Jesus is that Jesus has to come first. If we go over to Luke 14, 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus isn't coming out with a new theology. It's not this theology of hate. Um, hate is used as a comparison word here. We need to love Jesus so much that it seems like we hate everyone else. Um, this This kind of Description word, it, it was used in the Old Testament. Um, it talked about how uh, Jacob loved Rachel and that he hated Leah. But obviously he didn't truly hate in the, in the sense that we have of hate um, these days. That he didn't really hate Leah. You know, this is obvious because they continued to have children together. If he truly hated her, he would have nothing to do with her, wouldn't take care of her. Uh, they continued to have kids, so I don't think they truly that he truly hated, hated. Um, but we've got to have a love and a loyalty for Jesus that comes above anything else. Um, the loyalty has to come before even our family. If you look at Matthew 10, 34 through 37, it says, don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and a, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves his mother and his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So this loyalty, it's even got to come before ourselves. Um, so Jesus said, then he said to them, 
And if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? And that's Luke 9, 23-25. Now this has always been a little bit hard to comprehend. Uh, these days we don't, have, we don't see people carrying crosses, but back in that day, everyone knew exactly what Jesus meant when he talked about this. Um, carrying a cross, that was a one-way trip to death. Nobody ever came back down the hill from carrying their cross. You know, it would be similar as, like today, saying, pick up your electric chair or pick up a hangman's noose and follow me. Uh, we must be willing to suffer for Christ. Luke 14, 27 says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's Luke 14, 27. Trying to live godly lives inside an ungodly world, we may find that following Christ results in persecution and ridicule. The cross is a symbol of suffering, of death, of shame, of ridicule, rejection, self-denial, um, all of these things. So we end up, ways that we end up suffering for Jesus we suffer a lifelong battle against sin. We try not to sin. We try to do things out of our own power. Uh, it's, it's a daily fight not to sin. And it goes on all of your life. You never, you never get past it. It's not something we just one day finally mature from. We also suffer a war against Satan and the powers of darkness as we advance the kingdom of God. Uh, another way... We suffer, we suffer the hatred and ridicule of the world by testifying the love that it's, uh, we testify in love to them, that its deeds are evil. We separate ourselves both morally and spiritually. We refuse to accept the standards of this world. Um, so we get persecuted in that way. And then, just like Jesus, we also suffer ridicule and persecution from the religious world. Uh, there's a lot of that going on right now. You've got pastors coming out against pastors, Christians coming out against Christians, and it, it, it's not supposed to be that way, but those are ways that we suffer persecution. A lot of persecution comes out of the church. If you look at 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Simply put, we must forsake all to follow Jesus. Luke 14, 33 says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So if you're not ready to forsake everything to follow Jesus, you truly can't be a disciple of Jesus. So this is where, and if you go back through uh, Luke 14, you know, it talks, you need to figure out what it's going to cost you to be a disciple of Jesus um, and to, to go through with it. It talks about like building, building a tower or going to war, you know, generals sit down and figure out what the cost is going to be. How many men am I going to lose in a battle? What are the chances of me winning? Or do I need to go and make some kind of peace treaty? Um, you know, if you're building, if you're a carpenter building a tower, you're gonna sit down and figure out what all those, what all the costs are going into this project, or you're gonna, you're gonna start on something that you can't finish. You know, so that's where Jesus is just talking. Count the cost, figure out what it's gonna cost to be a disciple. Um, and I just tell you that being a disciple of Jesus is just completely going to be way worth um, anything that the cost, way more than what the cost is. So, first thing, Jesus must be the King and Lord of your life. Second thing, nothing can take precedent over Him and His will for us. So, it's going to cost to be a disciple of Jesus 
but there's also rewards that come from being a disciple of Jesus. So that's what we'll move into next, is looking at the rewards of being a disciple. So first we'll look at the promises of future blessing. So, we shall be saved from the wrath of God, which will come upon the world for its sin. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There's a wrath coming on the earth. It's, you know, there's, there's no getting, getting out of it. Wrath is coming on the earth. But if you know Jesus and you follow Jesus, we have been redeemed from that. Uh, we've been justified by the blood of Jesus. So we can totally take, um, we can put our hope and trust that we're justified by the, by the blood of Jesus and we're not gonna have to, have to go through that wrath. We can look forward to joy, spending eternity with God, free from sorrow, from pain, from death, Revelation 1.8 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he sat on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write. For these things are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's Revelations 21, 1 through 8. So we've got our promises of the future blessings. Now let's look at some of the, the promises for the present blessings. We're going to have blessings here on earth. The first thing we're going to look at, Jesus offers peace that the world can't give. To, our, to calm our troubled hearts. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's John 14, 27. You see, Jesus' peace isn't what the world calls peace. The world sees peace as the absence of problems. However, God's peace is not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent only on God himself. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christians can have great peace even in the midst of terrible troubles because of their faith in God. So another thing that God offers is he offers those who follow him the abiding love of God, which can cast out all fear. John 15, 9 says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And then 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's 1 John 4, 18. So there are many other blessings that I can talk about right now. Um, and that I could mention that are enjoyed by disciples of Jesus, but these should be more than enough to see that discipleship's costly, but the rewards far exceed the cost. So now I want to get uh, 
back into what it looks like in the beginning of discipleship. So if we go back to the original text that I started with last week, Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, as it goes, making disciples, the next step would be baptism. So why do we want to do baptism? What are we looking at? Remember, the goal of discipleship is to be like Jesus. Jesus was holy. Jesus was sinless. Yet we're to be like Jesus. Jesus was baptized. Um... You can look that up. Jesus in uh, Matthew 3, 13 through 17 talks about when Jesus went down and he was baptized by John the Baptist. Fortunately, baptism is described as an act of faith which puts us in contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ so we can be forgiven. So Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, baptism also means that one puts on Christ. So, Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So, we're putting on Christ were baptized. So baptism is, you know, the logical starting place for true discipleship. Um, what is baptism? Baptism is, it, it's an act of submission, which must be precedent or preceded by faith in Jesus and repentance for your sins. Uh, baptism ends up, it has to be full immersion. It talks in, the, in God's word about being buried with Christ, uh, sprinkling on the head, um, pouring on of water, uh, none of that would, would uh, justify the burial with Christ. It has to be a full immersion in water. Um, also, since it has to be preceded by faith, and repentance for our sins, that, that precludes infant baptism. Um, it actually has to be something you've got to be old enough that you can make that decision to repent and to have faith. Those are things that a, an infant doesn't have. We're all, all about dedicating our babies, but baptism is, is for people when they get older um, and they can make that decision. I'll get deeper into baptism at another time. Um, there's a lot of things I can talk about, about with that. Um, but our, our sins are washed away with the blood of Jesus. We're regenerated, and renewed by the Spirit of God so that we can live for God. Um, Titus 3, 5, and 6 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of re regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Titus 3, 5 through 6. Um, another thing, it's truly a rebirth involving water and the Spirit. John 3, 5 says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, it's another verse. I don't want to get too far into that, but I don't believe that baptism um, is required for salvation. I think, um, you know, if you haven't gotten baptized, I highly recommend it, but... If somebody was to die between getting saved and getting baptized, they're still going to end up in heaven. But baptism is a, is a thing about obedience that we must follow. So we need to... Teaching and obedience must be followed. So Matthew 28, 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this brings us back to the very definition of discipleship. Jesus taught that we are to be taught, we're to be learners. He taught that we are to observe, we're be, to be adherents and doers. We need to continue on with life devoted to learning and doing all that Jesus commanded us. So I'm going to wrap things up for tonight. Um, only those scripturally baptized and demonstrating the marks of discipleship, despite the cause, can truly be called disciples of Jesus. Only they can realistically look forward to the rewards of discipleship and can take consolation in the promise of Jesus. And Matthew 28, 20 says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus will be with us always. We just always need to make sure we continue on learning and following him and being a true disciple. So just want to pray really quick with you guys. I love you guys. We're so glad you're joining us. So glad you're part of our, our church and our movement. Um, just we're seeing great things. Great revival is coming out. I know some of these, this might seem a little bit, this might seem a little bit uh, basic to some of you guys, but it, we need to get back to the basics, I think. We just need to go on and continue, um, just kind of get back into the basics and go through a lot of this stuff that I'm, I'm learning as I study are things that I, I don't remember ever being taught. You know, I, I had a little bit of a different walk into, into salvation, but, you know, it's, it, it, there are definitely things, and we'll continue to build on this as we go through this series, oh, a Closer Walk with God, and I think it's really going to bless you guys. Thanks for joining us, and I just want to pray, Lord, when I just lift up everybody in the sound of air that, that hears my voice, as this goes out, if they're in their homes, wherever they're at, if they're on YouTube, Facebook, any place, Lord, I just lift them up. They care about you, Lord. You know the intents of their heart. And I just ask that you would teach them and help them be doers of your word, Lord, so that they can become true, true disciples of, of you, Jesus. We love you. And we just thank you so much for your mercy on us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Take care. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.